Hello, everybody. This is uh, Chaplain Bob. Um, happy January 24th, year 2020. Sorry about the poor sound quality, but my microphone just isn't here, so I'm using the mic that comes with the computer. Uh, this is going to be a collaboration between myself and Sally from Colorado. Um, please pray for her. She's uh, damaged from uh, smoking. Boy, a lot of us smoked. Uh, when I was, uh, after I'd smoked for about 12-something years, I lungs started hurting and I got strep throat and I quit smoking. Uh, so I didn't have any permanent damage, praise the Lord. But um, she's uh, become quite a... Bible scholar, in my opinion, and this is going to be in honor of Sally from Colorado. Please pray for her. Um, she's got uh, emphysema, or OCP, or whatever they call it. All right, so um, let me give you a little background. Genesis chapter 17. Oh, the title of this is, Is the United States of America in prophecy. And um, I say God knows the begin the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. He knows it all. All right, Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Uh, this is my part. I'm kind of building a foundation here. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Not just one little state in the Middle East, but he said he's going to be the father of many nations. And if you look up that word nations, it's the same word that they translate in the Hebrew as Gentiles. Now, can you imagine? Now, I'm not going to say the King James Bible has errors. Wrong. I'm not going to say that. Sometimes God hides things from people and not really hides it so you can't find out, but kind of hides it so that you have to dig it out. Okay, it wouldn't have made sense if God said, um, uh, you know, neither shall, oh, uh, well, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many Gentiles. You know, that wouldn't have made sense. So they said, you know, they translated and said, thou shalt be a father of many nations. Now, sometimes the word nations or Gentiles speaks of Israel. And sometimes it's speaking of the heathens. So you got to rightly divide the truth there. So just keep that in mind. Verse 5. I'm reading from the King James, which I trust. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed, thy children, thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. Wow. Um, you know, uh, does this sound like a covenant with the whole world? I don't think so. Sounds like, you know. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. 
And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee, in their generations. You spell generations, it's G-E-N-E, -E, gene, generations. You know, DNA. Um, all right, so let's keep going. Now, in Genesis 41, uh, verse 50, uh, we read about Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Isaac. Uh, he became one of the 12 tribes of Israel, and he had two children, Manasseh and Ephraim. So let's read Genesis 41, verse 50. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bear unto him. Now, I do not believe that these, this uh, priest were um, Egyptians. No. I know it says that they, uh, Joseph was given a wife of the priest, but it was not an Egyptian. During this time period, if you look up in your history, you will see that the uh, they were called the Hisk. Hiskosk, I'm not sure exactly uh, how to pronounce that, but it's H-Y-S-S-O-K. Uh, if you look at it, uh, they were a Semitic tribe, um, possibly of Shem, possibly of Japheth. Um, so Egypt, Joseph did not marry an Egyptian woman. He married a woman that was probably a Hiskosk who was rulers of Egypt back then. Eventually, the Egyptians overthrew them and took back over. That was the Pharaoh that knew not Joseph, that you can read about in Genesis and in the book of Exodus, uh, specifically Exodus, and they enslaved Israel. So, verse 51. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God, said he, hath made me, for, made me to forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God, caused, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Um, and the seven years of plenty, plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. Now, something you should realize, uh, the land of Canaan was called Canaan after um, the Canaanites, and he was like a son or grandson of Ham, and Canaan was cursed. So this group of people went into the land that God was going to give Israel to oppose them, okay? Um, all right, so let's go to verse 48. I haven't gotten to Sally's equipment yet. I'm uh, her study yet. I'm uh, building up the foundation. Genesis 48, 1. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. Now, his father was Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Okay. Uh, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jake, Jacob, and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee, and Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. Jacob and Israel were, you know, synonymous. Um, just like, you know, you could say USA, United States, America, the United States, America, you know. Jacob was Israel, Israel was Jacob. Verse 3. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came unto thee into Egypt are mine, as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. And thy issue, which thou begettest after them, shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. And as for me, when I came from Padan, 
Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way, when yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath, and I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, the same is Bethlehem. Now the word Beth means house. So if you ever hear anybody say Bethel, it means house of God. Or, okay, verse 8. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, These are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age. In other words, he's probably got cataracts or he's going blind. Um, now the eyes of Israel were dim for age so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God hath showed me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph, um, uh, let's see, and Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. Okay, now you got a right hand and a left hand, right? The right hand is the better blessing, and I think the left hand is going to be the lesser blessing. Now remember, Manasseh is the firstborn. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger. Remember, in the book of the law, the firstborn got a double portion. He got a double blessing. The firstborn always belonged to the Lord. I was the firstborn of my father. I guess that's why I belong to the Lord, I guess you could say, or rather how he puts up with me. So here we go. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long, unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, the angel which redeemed me from all evil. Bless the lads, and let my name be named on them. What name is that? Israel. And the name of my father, fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude, a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the Eph, uh, head of Ephraim, now remember, Ephraim's the younger. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God, make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you. But God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. And moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. 
Now here's an interesting verse, Deuteronomy 33:17. I'm still laying the foundation. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. Now, uh, the world's changed unicorns into being a horse with a horn coming out of its head. If you want to know what a unicorn is, uh, it's an Asian rhinoceros. Matter of fact, the name of it is Unicornus rhinoceros, rhinoceros or rhinoceros, whatever. Uh, with them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, the younger, and they are the thousands of Manasseh, which is the older people. You know, his glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them, now, if that's a rhinoceros, that makes sense, right? With them, the horns, he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Isn't that what United States did? Push the people to the ends of the earth and, and England? Some people think Manasseh is England, and some think the United States is Ephraim. Some think it's the other way around. All right, now, in Hosea 11.12, God prophesies, Ephraim compassed, compasseth me about with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah yet ruleth with God and is faithful with the saints. Now, I wonder who was um, the king of Judah back then, but uh, we'll, we'll find out. In Hosea 12, 14, it said, Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. Therefore shall he leave his blood upon him, and his reproach shall his Lord return unto him. Now, it doesn't sound too good, does in Hosea 13.1, it says, When Ephraim spake trembling, he exalted himself in Israel, but when he offended in Baal, he died. All right, let's go to Sally's study. In Ezekiel chapter 17, let's start at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, now think about it. Jesus called himself the Son of Man because he was God come in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 Son of Man, put forth a riddle and speak a parable unto the house of Israel and say, Thus saith the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings. What is the symbol of the United States? Uh, the bald eagle, right? A great eagle with great wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which had divers' colors. Divers. Um, it's not talking about a guy that goes under the sea, you know, like a Navy SEAL, no. Uh, divers is Old English. It's where we get the word diverse, you know, like diversity is our strength, they always love to tell us which had divers colors, came unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. He cropped off the top of his young twigs and carried it into a land of traffic. He set it in a city of merchants. People, think about New York City, right? He, also, he took also of the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field. Um, isn't the, the Midwest the bread basket of the United States? He placed it by great waters and set it as a willow tree. Now, a lot of people don't know it, but willow trees uh, is where they get aspirin from. Verse 6. And it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature, whose branches turned toward him, and the roots thereof were under him. So it became a vine. Israel's often in scripture called a vine. So it became a vine and brought forth branches and shot forth sprigs. There was also another great eagle with great wings and many feathers. And behold, this vine did bend her roots toward him and shot forth her branches toward him, that he might water it by the furrows of her 
plantation. And it was planted in a good soil by great waters. Mississippi River, uh, Great Lakes people, you know. Uh, that it might bring forth branches and that it might bear fruit, that it might be a goodly vine. Say thou, thus saith the Lord God, shall it prosper? Shall he not pull up the roots thereof and cut off the fruit thereof, that it wither? It shall wither in all the leaves of her spring, even without great power or many people to pluck it up by the roots thereof. Yea, behold, being planted, shall it prosper? Shall it not utterly wither when the east wind toucheth it? It shall wither in the furrows where it grew. Now, Sally writes, Is this passage about the rise and fall of the USA? We were founded on godly principles and placed in an Eden-like land with much fertile soil between the many waters of the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans and the Great Lakes as a country, we thrived when we worshipped God. As we fall away, do we wither? Is the east wind the Muslim horde that God sends to punish and destroy us? It will wither in the garden where it grew. Sally also writes, Ephraim was the second son, but it was him who received the greater blessing some believe Ephraim has a double or even triple reference, one of which, which represents the United States of America. We have a commonality with much prophecy surrounding Ephraim and are heading in the same direction, not yet fulfilling all the future prophecies. With the U.S. being the only country founded on Christian principles, many believe that we represent the church, the second young, the second son, the younger. Just as Israel represents God's chosen, uh, as Judah being the older, therefore we may also represent the falling away of the church, making us an apostate nation. The punishment for this is quite harsh, as you'll read in the following pages. A revival of repentance is our nation's only chance of being forgiven, but I have yet to find conclusive evidence of such an event in the future prophecy. The Lord once smiled upon our land with a multitude of blessings. As long as we loved and obeyed Him, but now one who knows God's Word cannot de deny how far we have fallen. Bob's note. Can you say abortion, pro-choice, sodomite marriage? What can I tell you, people? Um, in Hosea 4.17, we read, Ephraim is joined to idols. Their drink is rebellion. They commit harlotry continually. Her rulers dearly love dishonor. Name the last time we've had a godly president or Congress. Not in my lifetime. I think the closest we had was John F. Kennedy. And you know, uh, those of you should know what happened to him. In Ephraim 5, verse, verses 3 through 5, I know Ephraim and Israel. O oh, Ephraim, you commit harlotry. Israel is defiled. They don't direct their deeds toward turning to God. They don't know the Lord. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Therefore, Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. Judah, Judah also stumbles with them. In Hosea 5, verse 6, is 6 through 11, they'll seek the Lord but won't find him. He's withdrawn himself from them. Now, my note. When you seek the Lord with all your heart, and you humble yourself, and you repent, and you turn from your wicked ways, you will find the Lord. But when you only do it half-heartedly, and it becomes just a 
like a ritual. You live like a devil six days of the week, and then on church you go Sunday you go to church, and you think that's going to absolve you from everything. Uh, I don't think so. That's kind of what this is talking about. They'll seek the Lord, but won't find him. He's withdrawn himself from them. They've dealt treacherously with the Lord. They've begotten heathen children. Ephraim will be desolate in the day of rebuke. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment. Hosea 6.4 Oh Ephraim, what shall I do to you? In Hosea 7, verses 8 and 9, Ephraim has mixed himself among the peoples. Now, uh, aliens have devoured his strength, but he doesn't know it. Isn't that what most, isn't that what's going on today? I mean, you go to any hotel and it's the Hindu, I call it the Hindu hotel. People from India. And our own government is loaning them the money to buy these through the Small Business Administration. I know that because I worked for one of them in Denver. Uh, and because they're not U.S. citizens oftentimes, they don't pay uh, personal federal income tax. You know? Our, the aliens are devouring our blessings. All right, let's read as uh, Hosea uh, chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. Um, they are all hot as an oven and have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth unto me. Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. You ever heard the term, uh, that idea is half-baked? You know, it's burnt on one side, raw on the other. Ephraim is a cake not turned. That's where this com that saying comes from. Verse 9. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. And the pride of Israel testifieth to his face, and they not... They do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. Uh, I have never read in the Bible anything good about Egypt. And uh, I don't think I've ever read anything good about Assyria either. All right, let's keep reading verse 12. Hosea 7, 12. When they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. I will bring them down as the fowls of the heaven. I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. Woe unto them, for they have fled from me, destruction up unto them, because they have transgressed against me, though I have redeemed them. Yet they have spoken lies against me, and they have not cried unto me with their heart. When they howled upon their beds, they assembled, assembled themselves for corn and wine, and they rebel against me. Though I have bound and strengthened their arms, yet do they imagine mischief against me. They return, but not to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt." All right, let's go to uh, Hosea chapter 9, verse 9. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah, Gibeah. Therefore he will remember, therefore he, and we're talking about the Lord, therefore he will remember their iniquity, he will visit their sins. That means payback, people. So, uh, verse 10. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree, at her first time. Now, uh, my note, Israel was likened unto grapes, and the fig tree was the symbol of Judah. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time, but they went to Baal Peor. Now, Baal was Satanism. Um, but they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves unto that shame, and their abominations were according 
as they loved. As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird from the birth and from the womb and from the conception. Though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them that there shall not be a man left. Yea, woe also to them when I depart from them. Ephraim, as I saw Tyrus, is planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. That don't sound good, does it? Give them, O Lord, what wilt thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them, for the wickedness of their doings. I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Ephraim is smitten. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Yea, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. My God will cast them away, because they did not hearken unto him. And they shall be wanderers among the nations. Um, let's read this. Sally writes, Does the future hold sterility? Even if they bear children, I'll bereave them of every one. Woe to them when I turn away from them. I've seen Ephraim planted in a place, pl pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring out their children to the murderer. Abortion? Foreign inviters? Question mark. Because of the evil of their deeds, I'll drive them from my house. I'll love them no more. Wow. Heavy stuff, huh? All right, let's keep going here. Hosea 13, verses 12 and 13. The sin of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is stored up. The sorrows of a woman in childbirth shall come upon him. Uh, is this the beginning of sorrows? The time of sorrows of Jacob's trouble? Okay. He is an unwise son. He shouldn't stay long where children are born. Could this also represent a nation that's punished or destroyed while it's still young? The U.S. is a very young nation by global standards. The sin of Ephraim is stored on record to be revealed as evidence of guilt on Judgment Day. Whoa. All right. Um, the Ephraim of Hosea chapter 12 may represent our current administrations, uh, the Obamas, Clintons, Kerrys, with all their lies, dirty, secret, secret dirty deals, and treasonous covenants with our enemies, such as, she writes Iran, but I don't really consider Iran a enemy. Uh, there is another country in the Middle East that I consider an enemy. Uh, it starts with an I, uh, but it, I, it's not Iran, and it's not Iraq, if you catch my drift. Um, Hosea 12 Verses 1 and then 7 and 8. Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind. His day, He daily increases lies and desolation. They also make a covenant with him, the Assyrians. Um, that's Syria. The cunning Canaanite. Deceitful scales are in his hand. Um, you know, scales, like you weigh out a pound uh, of, let's say you're selling bread by the pound. Well, you make the the scale say 14 pounds. I mean, it's 14 ounces, but it shows a pound. Your scales are deceitful. You're not giving people a pound. You're only giving them 14 ounces of a pound. So they're talking about... Uh, she says, oh, is this about overtaxation and fuel prices? He loves to oppress by keeping the poor impoverished and depending, dependent on the government, you know, like uh, my note, like, you know, welfare and what have you. And with regulatory money and power grab, he said, surely I've become rich. I've found wealth for myself. In all my labors, they'll find in me no iniquity. Uh, they attempt to hide their crimes under layer after layer of lies, and they're never brought up on charges. And the mass media portrays them as innocent always showing them in a favorable light. Boy, she said a mouthful there. 
Uh, she writes, pursuing the East Wind may symbolize futile foreign policy attempts in the Middle East. Uh, my note, I, I think it the East Wind, I mean, let's face it, China's called the East, right? Um, a lot of people don't know it. Do you know China has more um, submarines in the United States now? Um, the people will tell you, oh, well, you know, they're poor quality. Well, there's a country in the Middle East that's, uh, it gets dolphin class submarines from Germany. And let me tell you something, people, if it's a country that knows how to make submarines, it's Germany. But they get dolphin class submarines from Germany, which are diesel electrics. And this country in the Middle East starts with an I, uh, has always been with favorable with communism. And I bet you they gave some of those German subs or at least the designs or what have you, to Red China. Now, why diesel electric subs? I just found this out a couple years ago. Uh, nuclear subs put out a lot of heat. And even though they're underwater, they put out a lot of heat. And there are satellites that pick up infrared, which is the heat frequency. And they were using these satellites to track underground fires. Uh, there was a fire in Pennsylvania that started when a uh, there was some kind of a coal mine, coal dust explosion, and it started burning underground, smoldering. And it's been burning since I was in high school. You're talking since the 70s, people, early 70s. And Towns have had, they've had to abandon small towns because, you know, it's burning underneath the buildings and the road. Um, so they were using these satellites to pick up the heat signatures of these underground fires. You couldn't see them with the naked eye, but the infrared can pick them up. Well, somebody got the bright idea and said, hey, I wonder if we could use these infrared satellites to pick up uh, nu nuclear subs under the water. Sure enough. You can. Uh, there's not one nuclear sub that can't be picked up underwater, to the best of my knowledge. So why would these countries not want nuke subs? They don't want their subs to be able to be tracked. So they use diesel electric subs. They're, uh, once they're underwater, you can't see them. So what can I tell you? Um, so... Red China's got a deep water, na uh, deep water navy now, and uh, I bet you they copied the German submarine designs, which are probably some of the best in the world. I'm not putting down the U.S. Navy, but you know, uh, the East Wind, China. You got to be a fool to give your enemies technology. Just remember, we fought Red China in the Korean War in the 1950s. I mean, you know, you got to be an idiot. Uh, Japan was a third world country until we and the British gave it uh, all our naval technology, which they repaid us on December 7th, you know, 1941 at Pearl Harbor. Of course, we pushed them into that war. What can I tell you? Um, all right. Back to what Sally says. Pursuing the East Wind may symbolize futile foreign policy attempts in the Middle East. The lies have piled up at, a, at an astonishing rate, rate, along with spiritual and moral desolation. Their wealth is ill-gotten gain coming from the blood, sweat, and tears of others here and abroad. All right, now let's go to Hosea 13. Verses 14 and 15 on. It says, I'll ransom them from the power of the grave. I'll redeem them from death. This redemption from death is in regards to the nation. There's no mention of repentance. So it may be that God has other punishment in mind before destruction. Thereby, not yet destroying the nation. Though he's fruitful among his brethren, wealthy and producing among his neighboring nations, an east wind shall come, the wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, 
his spring will become dry and his fountain dried up. He'll plunder the treachery. I mean, the treasury. He'll uh, he'll plunder the treasury of every desirable prize. Uh, now, let's see. She writes, in Israel, a scorching east wind would bring drought. But the real reality behind this Im imagery of the wind is invading armies from, she says, Arab nations. Um, I think it was Vancouver, Vancouver in China, or uh, I think it was Vancouver or British Columbia, I forget, in Canada. Uh, there's a city, <clears throat> excuse me, that's supposed to be 65% Chinese. Uh, wow. What can that tell you? Uh, she says, Our, uh, in, uh, but the reality behind this imagery of the wind is invading armies from Arab nations, even as you read this, were slowly and quietly being invaded by the so-called Muslim refugees, among others. We've invited plunder, pillage, rape, torture, cruelty, and murder into our land. Amen to that, I say. Now, uh, when you read Hosea 13 and 16, uh, she rebelled against her God. They'll fall by the sword. Their infants will be dashed to pieces and their women with child ripped open. Wow. Doesn't sound good, does it? Sure doesn't. Um, I think I'm going to make this a part one. Because this is, you know, we've gone 40 for 40 something minutes. And, um, but, uh, let's see. But we'll go to Matthew 24, 19. It says, Woe to those who are um, with child and to those nursing babies in those days. Sudden destruction would be less painful than the misery to come, keeping our nation Alive longer to experience these atrocities is the greater punishment of a deserving apostate nation, but it's also another opportunity opportunity to repent before it's too late. The day after the 9-11 terrorist attack, Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle quoted a passage on the Bible uh, of the Bible on nationwide television, Isaiah 9:10. Um, but to get to the context of this quote, Isaiah. 9 and 9 through 12 must be read in its entirety. Um, and then Senator John Edwards repeated Isaiah 9 10 on TV three years later. So let's take a look at that. All right, let's read Isaiah chapter 9. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and by the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee, Galilee of the nations. Now Zebulun and Naphtali are two of the twelve tribes. Verse 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. Uh, that has reference to uh, the book of Judges, people. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Now listen carefully. Verse 6. This is a messianic prophecy. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from Henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The Lord hath sent a word unto Jacob, and it hath lighted upon Israel. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, that say in the pride and stoutness of heart, 
The bricks are fallen down, but we will build them with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of reason against him and join his enemies together, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with open mouth. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. You know, people, if you're drowning and somebody stretches out their hand to t pull you out of the water, if they're on a boat and you're in the water and they're, you're drowning, that's the Lord. His anger is not turned away. But if you'll take his hand, his hand is stretched out still. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush, in one day. The ancient and honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. Now this is my note. Uh, when you take an animal and you lift up its tail, what do you see? The prophet that teaches lies. What do you see under the tail? And what comes out? That's, you know, I don't mean to be, I don't know. What can I tell you? For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Ooh. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall have mercy on their fatherless and widows. For every one of them is an hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Wow. For wickedness burneth as the fire. It shall devour the briars and thorns, and shall kindle in the thickets of the forest, and they shall mount up like the lifting up of smoke. Though the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire, no man shall spare his brother. And he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry, and he shall eat on the left hand, and they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh, and they together shall be against Judah. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. All right, people, this is going to be part one of my tribute to Sally. Uh, is the United States of American prophecy. All blessing, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.